Hey there, Jake here from CVP. I know we're a little late to the party with this one, but today I want to take a look at the Nikon Z8. This camera came out roughly two years ago now, and we've used it a few times since then, and have really enjoyed using it and the images we've captured with it. We've had loads of people comment asking us to look at this camera closer, so with the introduction of the ZR last month, I wanted to explore the sensor inside of this camera and show you why I really want to see a camera like the ZR that uses this fantastic sensor inside of the Z8. So let's take a look at how it performs, how it is to use, and whether it beats out its competition. Let's get into it. The Z8 was announced back in 2023, and since then it has received consistent updates to make it an even better camera than it was at release. We've had the Z8 in our showroom for a while, so we've all managed to take it out on a few different shoots to capture a range of example imagery. All three of us really enjoyed our time shooting with this camera and like the images we've managed to capture with it. The Z8 can capture beautiful detailed video and still images with nice color once you get them into resolve and processed. As a stills camera, this thing is a beast. 45 megapixels is on the higher end for a lot of applications, but this is partly how it delivers such detailed imagery. Let us know what you think of the images we've managed to capture down below. The Z8 features a 45.7 megapixel full frame stacked CMOS sensor with a resolution of 8,256 by 5,504. A size of 35.9 by 23.9 millimeters, there aren't too many cameras out there that use a fully stacked sensor, and they do have their own pros and cons. They can offer faster frame rates, autofocus performance, and overall readout speeds, but can also have reduced dynamic range in comparison to non-stacked sensors. But how does it perform? Well, let's take a look at our latitude testing. For these tests, we grabbed a few cameras we think the Z8 could be compared to that we had available. So in this test, we have the Nikon Z6 III, Canon R5 II, and Sony FX3. We used our 55mm Zeiss Otis and then EF adapters across the cameras. Here's a breakdown of our methodology for these tests and the different formats we shot across the different cameras. This means the raw clips won't have any noise reduction applied in both tests, whereas the FX3's internal clips do. Right, let's take a look at the results. Looking at overexposure first, we can see that the Zen 8 performs well up to around four stops over. At four and a third stops, we can see Sam's skin starting to break a little bit. From here, we lose more information until we hit about five and a third stops over. Comparing it to the other cameras, the Z6 III is very similar to the Z8. Looking at the R5 II, Sam's skin breaks a little bit sooner at four stops over, and the colors on our chart start clipping at roughly five and a third stops over. The FX3 has similar performance to the R5 II, with Sam's skin breaking at four stops over and color clipping on our chart at five stops. Moving on to underexposure, we shot the Z8 at both its low and high base ISOs. At minus three, it does start getting quite noisy, but color and detail are held well. From four stops under, it starts shifting purple, and from here, noise does get quite busy. Detail is held well though, even at the deeper stops. In high mode, it seems the chroma noise is a bit blockier, and the noise is overall more blue than purple. Compared to the Z6 III, I think the Z8 looks better. The Z6 III's noise looks blockier and has more chroma to it. Shadows also look more green than purple, and it has less detail overall. Looking at the R5 II, we can see good detail retention across the stops and less chroma noise. However, saturation is also far less compared to the other cameras. Lastly, the FX3 unsurprisingly looks good here. It looks good down to minus four stops, though you can see a little bit of CMOS smear here. The internal noise reduction obviously helps it out here but it also has less detail compared to the other cameras. Up next, let's check out how this camera handles infrared light pollution. This is an unnamed camera with its ORPF removed as an extreme example of what IR pollution can do to your image. For these tests, we grabbed a range of different black fabrics as different types will behave differently to each other and then blasted an Ari Blonde at them. We then went through our range of our Polar Pro Variable ND, adjusting aperture on our lens to keep exposure consistent. Starting off looking at the camera with no ND, which we white balance for, we can see that throughout the range there is no purple shift as we hit the deeper stops, which is good. There's a slight shift, but it doesn't look like IR pollution. We also didn't run into any issues when shooting outside in bright sunlight, which is good as well. Let's talk about the camera's sensor readout speed. For these controlled tests, we are using our own in-house measuring tool and software so we can give you some numbers and compare them to other cameras we've measured before. Thanks to the fully stacked sensor in the camera's full frame mode, we get a readout time of roughly 14.5 milliseconds which is pretty good for an 8.3K camera. These are some pretty good figures, and it will be fast enough for most filming situations. And if you want a faster readout, you can easily just go into one of the line skipped 4K modes and get a much faster speed. The ZR and the Z6 III 
do beat it out though, but given their lower resolution, that's not too surprising. The sensor inside the Z8 has a dual native ISO, which changes between the different gamma profiles. In NLOG and RAW, it is 800 and 4000, and then in the SDR profiles, it is 100 and 500. In NLOG and RAW, as you go up the ISO range, you can see a clear step at 4000 ISO, where the camera's noise cleans up. Looking at the ProRes 42 footage and RAW, we can see a clear difference between them because of the internal noise reduction that you can enable in the camera. So if you shoot in lower light scenes, you will need to decide whether you want to shoot RAW and denoise in post, or shoot compressed in camera with some noise reduction applied, but both can work well, and the Z8 can capture detailed images in lower light scenarios. The Z8 has a bunch of different recording formats and codecs to choose from. The best way to break them down though is into RAW and non-RAW formats. There are currently two flavors of RAW in the camera, Nikon's NRAW and ProRes RAW. But of course, if we see a Z Cinema version of this camera, we will most likely see the addition of R3D NE, which is in their new ZR camera. With Resolve 20.2, Blackmagic added support for R3D NE. And we actually had a comment on our ZR video saying that if you rename NRAW file extensions from .NEV to R3D with clips shot with Nikon cameras, it actually allows Resolve to see them as R3D NE files. So we tested this with some of the Z8 clips, and yes, it does work. So if you have a Nikon camera that can shoot NRAW and want to take advantage of this, you can easily batch process renaming of clips on a Mac by hitting rename, replace text, and then replacing .NEV with .R3D. You will then be able to just bring them into Resolve and have the same parameters as you would expect with normal R3D. However, one thing we noticed is that when you do this, the R3D versions of these files lose the lens correction profiles that the NRAW files have built in. Comparing the same shot as NRAW and R3D, if we keep the NRAW clip in NLOG and use a scientific LUT, we can see a difference. But if we color space transform from NLOG to red log 3G10 and red wide gamut, and then use a red scientific LUT, the image looks very similar. When you start messing with exposure and white balance though, there is a slight difference in manipulation between them, but it's very slight. I personally think R3D is nicer in regards to control parameters in Resolve though. Comparing the two different RAW panels, you can see just how different they are. On the R3D clip, you can control exposure with ISO stops instead of just an exposure slider that NRAW uses, and you have the ability to enable red's built-in chroma noise reduction. Enabling this does actually improve the noise performance pretty substantially. If we look at our waveform in Resolve, we can see just how much of a difference it makes. The R3D clip waveform with the noise reduction off looks very similar to the NRAW clip. And of course, you have the ability to control an output using RED's IP2 color pipeline, which we love using. The NRAW panel does have a few extra controls the R3D does not though, such as baked in lens corrections, lens vignette control, and all these image controls here. When we tested the ZR, there was a difference between the internally recorded R3D NE and NRAW files, but this doesn't seem to be the case with these clips being renamed and performing a CST. Premiere Pro doesn't support NRAW files, but it does support R3D. So if you do this renaming trick, you can actually import these files and get full R3D control in Premiere, which is pretty awesome. Honestly, this is such a quick thing to do when you hit post. I think if you're happy with the lack of lens corrections, doing this is a no brainer as R3D is so much nicer to work with. Compressed formats are an area that I think Nikon really do need to improve in their mirrorless cameras and hopefully in their Z Cinema cameras as well. In the Z8, you can record in ProRes 42HQ, which is 4210-bit, H.265, which is 4210-bit, and H.264, which is 4208-bit. So like the ZR, you have no compressed 10-bit 42 option other than 42HQ ProRes, which still has pretty high data rates. In NRAW, you have two options, high and normal quality, which are effectively two different compression amounts. If you want to get the absolute best image quality out of this camera possible, shooting 8.3K NRAW high quality will give you that. But obviously this is at the expense of larger file sizes and higher processing power needed in post. If you don't want to shoot 8.3K RAW, you have the option to shoot in NRAW and ProRes RAW HQ in 4.1K, but the data rates are much higher for ProRes RAW than NRAW, even with NRAW in high quality. Support for ProRes RAW has improved massively thanks to Resolve now being able to process it. But I still think for most, recording in NRAW is the way to go. The Z8 doesn't have an OLPF, whereas the ZR does. This means that you can run into moray and aliasing with certain patterns, but can also get very detailed images with this camera. 
If we saw a Z Cinema version of this camera, I would love to see an OLPF used with this sensor to help with this. If we take a look at our chart tests, we can see some extreme examples. In 8.3K NRAW, we can see some color aliasing on our focus chart in both high and normal quality. When we drop down to the 4.1K NRAW, we can see a clear difference in resolving power. The 4.1K has much more color aliasing and less detail. Nikon won't tell us how they are achieving this 4K RAW, but if we look at some of the compressed modes, we can see that some of these in 4K perform much better than the 4K RAW when it comes to resolving power and aliasing, as they are downsampling the full sensor. You also have the ability to go into the DX crop mode, which could be helpful if you want a bit more reach out of your lenses or want to use lenses that are designed for smaller sensor cameras. It's good that you have all these options to choose from. As I said earlier, I think the camera has the best image quality in NRAW 8.3K. If you don't want to deal with the resolution and file sizes of that though, at least you have the option to shoot in the 4.1K RAW, or if you want to shoot compressed, I think ProRes 42HQ 4K is a good option as well. If you want to keep up with the latest and greatest kit, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you want to buy anything you see in this video, or want to get your hands on the Z8, or any other kit for that matter, head over to cvp.com where our experienced team is waiting to help you. Nikon's mirrorless cameras currently have quite limited color profiles when it comes to shooting video. When you select your codec, you have to hit right on the joystick, which will allow you to choose between SDR and Log. The Z8 only has the option to shoot in Nikon's N-Log, which captures in the N-Log Gamma and Rec 2020 color space. When in SDR, you set the picture control here in the menu. These will look like standard stills profiles and not video specific ones. These cameras and the ZR really need more standard video gammas and color space options for people who don't want to record in log or raw in camera. This is also the case with the ZR. I would love to see Nikon implement RED's internal color science like the systems in the RED DSMC3 cameras across the board of their stills and Z Cinema line cameras. That would be fantastic. At the moment, I think shooting log or raw is the best way to go though with the Z8 and in post, you can still get a nice looking 709 image fast with the right scientific LUT or a color space transform. When shooting stills, the colors are lovely to work with. When processing the rolls through Lightroom, the results look great. When it comes to recording higher frame rates, you have a mix of different options available. You can record 8.3K up to 60 frames per second in NRAW or 4K in NRAW up to 120 frames per second with no crop. This is unusual to see for RAW and Nikon won't tell us how they are achieving it. The AK60 footage looks really nice, and while you can see a reduction in sharpness in the 4K 120 mode, it still looks good. In RAW, you can then window down and achieve 6K60 in NRAW, and in a 2.3x crop, you can shoot UHD NRAW up to 120 frames per second, which also looks good. When in the camera's compressed mode, you can shoot 8.3K up to 30 frames per second in H.265, 4K60, and Full HD up to 120 frames per second in either H.265 and ProRes 42HQ. This is a really solid range of frame rate options. Being able to record 8K60 RAW is pretty fantastic for a camera of this size and price, and the results look great. The Z8's 5 axis sensor shift image stabilization system isn't quite as advanced as the ZR and the Z6 III. It has roughly two stops less performance compared to those cameras. The camera has a range of different modes, including electronic stabilization for extra performance. You have a normal and sport mode. Sport being designed for panning shots and normal being the recommended mode for most situations. It also has digital stabilization in the non-raw modes. Looking at the performance, it's good but could be better. So if we see this sensor technology inside a Z Cinema camera, hopefully we see an updated stabilization system that builds on the performance of the ZR and the Z6 III. One neat trick the Z8 has is the ability to fully lock down the sensor. This means that for certain configurations and productions, like car mounting, you can lock it down and turn off IBIS to try and stop your image from doing anything weird because the sensor can move. It's good that you have the best of both worlds and this is something I would love to see Nikon have in all of their more video focused cameras going forward. As the Z8 features the same X-Speed 7 processor as the Z9, ZR and Z6 III, performance should be similar to those cameras. The system in these cameras is decently comprehensive and offers a range of customization for different subjects and scenarios. When shooting both stills and video, it feels snappy to use and tracking works well. You can switch between a range of different subjects such as people, animals, birds and vehicles and even have the camera in auto which will switch between them all for you. It will be great for both photographers and videographers to use across a range of different shooting scenarios. 
We tested the autofocus quite a lot in our ZR review, so if you want to learn more about it, check that video out. Every time I pick up the Z8, it fills me with confidence that it's going to survive the abuse that cameras can sometimes have. It's built like an absolute tank. Honestly, it's one of only a handful of mirrorless cameras that I've picked up throughout the years that just feels right. It feels almost as comfortable to hold as a traditional DSLR. It is a bit larger though than some other mirrorless cameras out there, but that might be a part of why it feels the way it does. It feels great in the hand, and once you get used to using it, it's fantastic for shooting stills, and it's good for video as well. There are features in this camera that are fantastic and I really appreciate, such as the punching tool, which is superb, the EVF is fantastic, the mechanism for the rear LCD is good, you have the ability to expose using a waveform, and you can use shutter angle instead of speed. But I think it does need some tweaks and additions to make it even better for video. And if we do get a Z Cinema version, I really hope to see a few things added. Even the ZR needs some tweaks in my mind, but with a few firmer changes and additions, these cameras can become incredible hybrid systems. In my mind, one of Nikon and now RED's biggest strengths in the current camera market is the Z lens mount. Z is one of the shallowest lens mounts on the market at just 16 millimeters. This means you can adapt loads of your standard larger flange lenses like EF and PL, but also Sony E-mount with the correct adapter. This honestly is a massive plus for these cameras and will make them not only more flexible, but it also opens them up to everyone who's invested into Sony's E-mount glass, but wants to give cameras like the Z8 or ZR or any other Z-mount camera from Nikon or RED a go without completely changing lens ecosystem. There are a few brands of Z to E-mount adapters, but from our testing, the Megadap ETZ21 works the best. This adapter allows you to use Sony E-mount lenses pretty much exactly as they would behave on an E-mount system. So you get full auto and manual focus, aperture control, and lens customization. There are also a bunch of Nikon native lenses available as well at a range of different price points. One lens that we have collectively loved in the studio every time we've used it is the Nikon 24 70 mm f2.8 Mark I, which has a really lovely look to it, especially for a modern 24 to 70 mm lens. The Z8 is a pretty awesome camera that can capture some really great looking imagery and it's a pleasure to use, even for lifelong Canon stills camera users like us. I know it's been out for a while, but we are still pretty new to Nikon's ecosystem. And now that you can buy their cameras through us, including the Z8 and the ZR, I thought it was worth us taking a look at this camera as we've wanted to for a while. And it's still an excellent hybrid camera. We can't wait to see what else Nikon and RED release together, but let us know if there are any other Nikon products you think we should check out in the comments below. If you want to come in and test this camera or anything out for yourself, you can book an appointment at our UK and European showrooms, where you can get your hands on and test the cameras, rig them up and check out some lenses with one of our knowledgeable technical consultants. If you want to book an appointment, drop demo at cvp.com and email. Anyway, let us know if you have any other questions about the Z8 in the comments. And if you like the video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.